I'll direct your attention to just an exciting insight into a passage of Scripture. The Gospel is recorded by the Gentile physician Luke, chapter 24. When you look there, you will find in about the fifth verse, And the angel said, He is not here, but is risen. He is not here, but is risen. And then it goes on to say something, I think, to the effect of remember how he spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee, saying that on the third day he would rise again. He is not here, but is risen as he said. That's one of the versions of that, of those verses. I want to direct your attention for a few minutes to something that I'm always excited about at a time like this and that is what I call a dialogue with death a dialogue with death he is not here but is risen he is not here but is risen. This is the news dropped by some celestial messengers to some sorrowing sisters who had made their way to the Savior's sepulcher on this given Sunday morning. Said the angels to the ladies, He is not here but is risen. He was here. He just ain't here now. Ladies, though you are early, you're late. Uh, you got here early, but he rose even earlier. Sisters, said the angels to the ladies, just like the S-U-N has risen, the S-O-N has also risen. And the only explanation given to these sorrowing sisters on that given Sunday morning at the Savior's sepulchre by these celestial messengers from another world is in the form of the memory jolting verse that says, Remember how he spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee, saying that on the third day he would rise again? In other words, what the angels are really saying when you synopsize it is, didn't he tell y'all he wasn't going to be here? So the angels didn't even understand the sister's presence because he said he wasn't going to be there. And so here it is, these sorrowing sisters are now the victims of a missing corpus delecti at a time that they wanted to mourn and give praise in their own way and the only thing they get is some creatures from another realm giving a simple explanation he is not here but is risen now my brothers and sisters I am a spiritual snoop and I'm always looking for some scriptural scoop and I as a believer feel that we as believers have a right to know a little bit more about what happened to the missing corpus delecti of Jesus of Nazareth. We have a right to know more than these angels are giving us. These creatures from another realm show up and our Lord who has healed the sick, raised the dead, snatched knots out of the tongues of the dumb, removed plugs from the ears of the deaf, put walking in lame limbs and activity in withered hands. He's uh, resurrected others from the dead. And now the only thing that's gotten is some creatures from another realm saying, He is not here but is risen. As a believer, I'm a Jacob type who does not mind wrestling when I've got a chance to wrestle. I 
am, I was at the time of writing this message determined to get more of an explanation as to the missing corpus delecti of Jesus of Nazareth than some creatures from another realm showing up offering just a couple of words, he is not here but is risen. I believe that I have a right as a believer to know more about what went down y'all between sunset Friday and sunrise Sunday morning. I wanted to know. I'm a Jacob type believer so I've learned even from Jacob that you can put a stranglehold on divinity and you can even hold him until he leaves you a blessing. So I asked God uh, what can I find out? Who can talk to me about what happened to our Lord's body between sunset Friday and sunrise Sunday morning. I've got to hear from somebody for faith's sake. I want to know more. It's bad enough that sometimes we believers cannot explain our faith. We cannot talk about it. So I refuse to accept this brief explanation by some creatures from another realm telling me he is not here but is risen. I was determined to talk to somebody and in that there is an alleged resurrection only God can do a resurrection and the word is that whenever God does anything God never leaves himself without a witness so y'all I've got an edge on this thing because if there is a witness in terms of this resurrection if there was somebody else who knows what went down between sunset Friday and sunrise Sunday morning, I've got a right to dialogue with them. They owe me an explanation as to why my Lord's body is missing. I wanted to know with whom I could talk. So, in talking to the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost said, well, why not talk to the star witness? Uh, the star witness, who's that? Well, it's a sense that it's not the soldier. See, I can't talk to the soldiers because the soldiers have already been paid to lie about the missing body. I, I can't talk to the sisters because they got there after the fact. Y'all, I can't talk to uh, the angels because their appearances on terra firma with us mortals is always in the form of monologues. They never appear in order to dialogue with us. They are messengers from the Most High and they come and deliver their messages and go back and stand in line until the next time. So I can't talk to the angels, I can't talk to the soldiers, I can't talk to the sisters. What about the apostles? No, you know Nicodemus was always lurking in the dark and then Simon Peter y'all followed him afar off and Judas has gone out and committed suicide. So the other nine have gone back fishing and Doubting Thomas is Doubting Thomas. So I can't talk to the apostles, I can't talk to the angels, can't talk to the sisters. God, with whom can I talk? And he said, talk to the star witness. Uh, the star witness? Yes, the star witness of what went down between sunset Friday and sunrise Sunday morning. The star witness, y'all, is death. Uh, death. Uh, the grim reaper, death, that cold, unconscionable reality that is part and parcel of the human pilgrimage, death. Uh, Y'all, for a little while, God's going to let us talk with death. Uh, he is now the stingless victimizer uh, of the household of the living. Uh, we've got a chance. Eternity has given permission both to death and we are exercising our rights as believers to talk with death about what went down uh, on Friday between sunset and the sunrise Sunday morning. Uh, Mr. Death, oh Mr. Death, uh, eternity has allowed us to talk with you here at Mount Pisgah for just a little while about what went down between sunset Friday and sunrise Sunday morning. We want to know about the missing corpus delecti of our Savior. We can't talk to a lot of others, but since you were there and God has given us permission, Mr. Death, we want to talk to you for a little while. Uh, Mr. Death, 
please forgive me. Uh, my mother has taught me better than to stare at people. But Mr. Death, when I look at you or I look toward you, I have difficulty apprehending just who and what you are because you lack certain anthropomorphic features. Uh, Mr. Death, I can't talk about your head and your eyes and your ears and your upper torso. Mr. Death, you are constructed rather awkwardly. Uh, is there a reason for the way you're built as compared to us as men and women? Mr. Death, you can talk to me. Uh, Mr. Death says, well, young blood, uh, the reason I'm built the way I am in order that I can do my job. Uh, I am blind. I have no uh, apparatus for seeing. I have no eye sockets where my eyes have been taken out. I am just blind. I've been made to be blind in order that color consciousness might not control me. Uh, it does not matter even in a racist society where, you know, if you're white, you're right. If you are uh, brown, stick around. If you're yellow, you're mellow. But if you're black, you got to get back. Uh, that doesn't matter to me. I'm blind because I don't see color. Uh, you can be as white as the drifting snow. You can be as yellow as crimson, as red as the noonday sun. You can be as black as a thousand midnights down in a cypress swamp. When it's your time to go, it's your time to go. So I'm blind in order that color consciousness might not control me. Uh, uh, Mr. Death, uh, is there another reason that you're blind? Yes, I'm blind in order that social status may not affect me. Uh, I don't care who you are. You can be as high as a prince or as low as a pauper. When it's your time to go, it's your time to go. Uh, I pull princes from thrones, paupers from gutters. I take presidents from nations and populations from a citizenry. When it's my time to move, I do my job well, and I am constructed so that I can do my job. That's why I'm blind. Uh, Mr. Death, uh, while we are in dialogue, uh, this is by divine permission, but I notice that you do not have apparatus for hearing. Uh, is there a reason you have no ears? What's going on? Mr. Death says, well, no, I don't have anything for hearing. This is a new opportunity. Uh, I'm uh, deaf in order that last minute negotiations might not sway me. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm deaf. I'm deaf. I'm deaf. See, I can't hear I ain't ready yet. Uh, I can't hear wait till my children grow up. Uh, I can't hear let me get my house in order. I can't hear give me one more chance. When it's your time to go, it's your time to go. I'm blind in order that color consciousness might not control me. I'm blind so that social status will not affect me. And I'm deaf in order that last minute negotiations won't sway me. I can't hear wait till my children grow up. I can't hear none of that. When it's your time to move, it's your time to move. Uh, young blood, since you all are curious about me this morning and I've got divine permission to talk with y'all, let me also tell you that if you could check that portion of what would be my anatomy called the upper torso on you mortals, if you had a stethoscope, that medical instrument that measures heartbeat, you would discover that I am without a heart. I am heartless. I ain't got no problems taking a mama from her children or children from their parents. I have no problems taking a spouse from a household or a president from a nation. I've got no problems with good folk dying as well as devils dying. I'm heartless in order that I won't be controlled by the stuff that messes y'all up when it comes to doing the right or even the wrong thing. Is that enough about me? Uh, Mr. Death, talk to us a little bit. Uh, where'd you come from? Uh, oh, oh, um, um, uh, Adam's rebellious act made room for me in creation. Uh, uh, if you faithful people, so-called faithful people, read your Bible, you would know that by sin came death into the world. So I'm here because, uh, you know, Adam sponsored me in that garden and then Cain also capitalized and took out a contract with me on his brother in that garden also. 
So I am here because uh, the wages of sin is death and life and death go hand in hand. You can't have one without the other. Don't y'all realize now that you don't die because you're old? You don't die because you're knifed by a maniac? You don't die because you're struck by a drunken driver? You don't die because disease invades your body? You don't die because you're old? You die because you are alive! A life and death go hand in hand. So if you don't want to die, you don't want to live. Uh, it has been once appointed unto all men to die and after death the judgment. Well, Mr. Death, we know you're busy. We know you're busy. Uh, Frank Bell is doing big business. We know you're busy. Uh, the hearse wheels keep on rolling. The church bells keep on tolling. Uh, po uh, cemeteries are plagued by overpopulation. We know you're busy. We know you're busy. Uh, but how busy are you? And Mr. Death says, well, look, y'all need to recognize that I got access to every house in the universe. Oh, yeah, I can operate in the church house. I can operate in the courthouse. I can operate in the White House. And whether y'all know it or not, I got access to y'all's house. I'm busy. I've got a job to do. As long as there, there's life, there will be death. Uh, Mr. Death, um, what is your what is your affiliation? Uh, Mr. Death says, "Well, uh, I work for God and the devil. I, I work for God and the devil. Uh, but some of y'all work for me. Uh, some of y'all work for me. Uh, um, uh, I, uh, I, uh, I, I I've been used by God. I've been used by the devil. Um, so you know that'll speak for itself." But some of y'all work for me. Now, even if you have not pulled the trigger, if you have not poisoned anybody, if you have not knifed somebody to death, if you've not accidentally run somebody down with a vehicle, you still work for me when it comes down to death. Because, you see, God has given us a weapon or a tool that is so powerful that it only weighs about a pound but it has to be locked in a cell with 32 bars. It's called the tongue. Uh, oh, oh y'all don't read your Bibles? Well, don't you, haven't you read that the power of life and death is in the tongue? Uh, uh, somebody killed somebody this morning. Saying the wrong thing, the wrong way. And maybe even the right thing the wrong way. So while I'm affiliated with God and the devil, some of y'all work for me. Uh, Mr. Death, uh, what is your track record overall? And Mr. Death says, well, I've got a great track record. I've got a great track record. Y'all, I got Adam, I got Eve, I got Seth, I got Enoch, I got Noah, I got Abraham, I got Isaac, I got Jacob, I got Esau. I got Moses, I got Joshua, I got David, I got Solomon, I got all the major prophets, all the minor prophets, I got Job. Uh, I know that Methuselah uh, got a, a, an extension. I had to wait for him for 969 years, but I got him. I, I, I got him. I, I went on and I got, I, I got uh, Matthew, I got Mark, I got Luke. I got John, I got Timothy, I got Paul, I got all of them, y'all. Well, no, Mr. Death, you missed a few. Who, young blood? Well, what about the Tishbite boy? And what about Elijah? And, 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 and what about Melchizedek? And what about uh, Jairus' daughter? And what about the son of the widow from Nain? Young blood, I missed them the first time, but I got them on the second go-round. I was all right until I got to Calvary. My record was almost perfect. And even with the folk you think I didn't get, you can't prove I didn't get it. And when I work for the devil, I can lie to you and say I did, and it's still the truth. I was all right until I got to Calvary death, that's why we're here. But before that, 
What do people really think of you, Mr. Death? What do you think is their assessment of you? Mr. Death says, well, I'm well respected. I'm well respected. It isn't until I threaten that some of y'all get right with God. It isn't until I threaten that you recognize the limitations of riches and the folly of riches and the limitation of family. Then you recognize that you need to get it together. That stuff you thought was important ain't that important. When I threaten, I'm well respected. I've got my place in the human equation. All right, Mr. Death, we need to get out of here. We've been here since about six. But we want to talk to you now about what happened between sunset Friday and sunrise Sunday morning. Mr. Death says, well, I've got to talk to you because the creator of the universe has given me orders to do so. Let me talk to y'all for a minute about what happened on that hill of horror beneath that darkened sky in the midst of those cursing men on that fateful Friday evening. Let me talk to y'all about what happened. Now, I could synopsize it by putting it in six words. Six words would tell you really what went down. And those six words are, I had no business being there. I had no business being there. Uh, you had no business being there, Mr. Death? He says, no, I had no business being there. He said, see, um, those two fellas on those two outside crosses, they warranted my presence. But I shouldn't have ever messed with that man on that middle cross. Since I'm here to tell that story, I went up there and I had no business being there. I went up there, y'all, and I grabbed that man on that middle cross, and I had no business touching him. I had no business touching him. In fact, I was so confused that day that I don't know who I worked for, God or the devil. But those religious racketeers and those perverted politicians, they were willing to sponsor me. So I went to Calvary because there was a job there, and I don't like being unemployed, and I do not loiter. But I went up there, and I grabbed that man on that middle cross. And y'all heard what I said, right? I had no business being there. Let me tell you why. I went up there, and I grabbed that man on that middle cross. And when I grabbed him, I had no business grabbing him. You see, he was really deathless because he was sinless. Uh, don't you remember that the wages of sin is death? And in that he was without sin, I ain't had no business messing with him. But I did. I did. I grabbed him. Not only was he without sin, but the other reason I had no business grabbing him is that he wasn't but 33. Now, the promise is three score years and ten, and if by reason of strength they be four score, which is eighty, uh, David said, yet is their strength, labor, and sorrow. So he was thirty-three, not seventy, not eighty, but thirty-three. And in that he was thirty-three, I had no business messing with him because the rule was at least seventy. He was without sin, and he was only thirty-three. Y'all... I had no business messing with that man to the point that I couldn't even use disease to enter his body in order to snuff out his flame of life. I couldn't use disease. I couldn't make him sick unto death. And you know why I couldn't do that? Because he had more medicine in the hem of his garment than all the drugstores in town. He was such a healer that even his spittle had medicinal properties because he spat on the ground one day and gave sight to a blind man's eye. I couldn't even, I couldn't even sneak up on him. Um, um, 
I, I tried to sneak up on him. You know, when they gave him, you know, the Pascha, when they gave him that, that vinegar and all, it was also part anesthesia. It was supposed to have numbed his body from some of the pain while it yet gave a certain amount of energy. And so when they offered it to him, I figured I could sneak in under the anesthesia and he rejected it. He rejected it and said, look, I'm not taking that because I want to present my body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. This is my reasonable service. Ted says, I couldn't even sneak up on him through anesthesia. This death, is that all? No, that ain't all. That ain't all. It got so bad up there when I was dealing with that man that he insulted me on at least three occasions. Uh, what happened, Mr. Death? Mr. Death said, well, first of all, I was there trying to take his life and take the life, the lives of those two men on those two outside crosses. I was up there taking. I'm a taker, y'all understand? That's why the humans who work for me are called undertakers, but I'm the overtaker. I was up there trying to take his life and in my effort to take his life he just knocked me back and said no no man takes my life I lay it down and then guess what he did I'm still there trying to take and he's up there giving uh, uh, y'all know the last words from the cross he gave forgiveness to the whole world for all times. In his words, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And then in the second word, he said to the thief that was next to him, he gave him last minute reservations on the evening train to paradise. When he said, today you're going to be with me in paradise. And then he looked down and he gave his mama to John and John to his mama. And even before it was all over, he gave his spirit back to his father. I'm there trying to take and he's up there giving. He just insulted me. Uh, uh, y'all, I got to tell you the whole story, and y'all know I'm busy, so I got to get out of here, and uh, y'all got somewhere to go to. Just be careful. You might have an appointment with me somewhere. Uh, so, 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 so I, 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 uh, I, I grabbed him. I grabbed him. I grabbed him. I grabbed him. I blitzed him. I blitzed him. I bum rushed him. I grabbed him. I grabbed him with everything I had. And y'all, he was so powerful all unto himself that when I grabbed him, I had to let everybody else go. And that's why your Bible reads that the dead got up and went walking through the streets of Jerusalem. When I grabbed Jesus, I had to let Abraham go, and when I let Abraham go, he reached over and took, touched Isaac, and Isaac touched Jacob, and Jacob touched Esau, and Esau touched all the others, and the dead got up and went walking through the streets of Jerusalem. I had to let everybody else go. And then y'all, as if that wasn't enough, I held him. I got him. Now I had to let all them others go. But I got him. The problem is, I could only hold them from sunset Friday mm -hmm. to sunrise Sunday morning. I, I held him. I wrestled. I took him down into the abysmal depths of hell, into my headquarters, and he he blew out my flame. And I'd never seen it before. All throughout human history and before, God used angels because I was one of them. And when I got him and put him in the tomb, Angels lined up to go down and wake him up to rescue him. And God the Father Creator said, nope, that's my boy. I'm 
going down. Gabriel wanted to blow his trumpet. The father said, no. Raphael, the swiftest angels, wanted to go into flight. God said, no. That's my boy. I'm going down and resurrect my son. And that's why the apostle Paul writes that if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. All things have become new. But he also writes that, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. God the Father came to see about his son. I told y'all I had no business being there. Well, that was it when the father came. The father woke up his son. And when he woke up his son, I remember the father is the rock. But his son is also a rock. And remember, he was buried in a rock. So that morning, the angels had rolled the stone away. And then the father, who was already inside, he didn't roll the stone away in order for Jesus to get out. He rolled the stone away in order for the sisters to get in. But the father took care of business on the other side. So he shook Jesus. And when Jesus woke up, uh, y'all, a rock looked up at a rock. And then a rock reached in and got a rock out of a rock. And a rock stepped out on a rock. And today, they're known as the Rock of Ages. And Jesus, having said it is finished, added more insult to injury. When he got out of the grave, he just stripped off his grave clothes. But he didn't rush. He neatly folded them. He, he wasn't even in a hurry to get away from me. And then he looked at me. And when he looked at me, he gave the benediction for all times. He raised one hand and said, Death, Where's your sting? And then he raised his other hand and said, Grave, where's your victory? And then he looked up and said, All power is in my hands. And to you, faithful, that's what happened between sunset Friday and sunrise Sunday morning. That's what the angels meant when they said, he ain't here, he's risen. Risen, y'all. Risen. If I could really talk to you the way I feel as your pastor, I would tell you, take off them crosses and crucifixes because we serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he's risen no matter what men may say. I hear his voice of cheer. I see his hand of mercy. He's always near. Jesus lives. He 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 lives. He's risen, y'all. That's alive and well. He's risen. Breathing in motion. He's risen. Coming to see about us whenever we call him. He's risen. Sitting on the right hand of the Father. He's risen. Neatly folded grave clothes. He's risen. An empty tomb. He's risen. Said, come unto me, all ye that labor and a heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. He's alive and well. Can I tell you just a little bit of how I know? Because he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me that I am his own. He's alive and well. We serve a risen Savior. A risen Savior.
a risen Savior, a risen Savior, a risen Savior. Because he lives, we can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fears are gone. Because I know who holds the future. Life is worth the living because he lives. Tell somebody, he lives. He lives. He lives. He lives, he lives inside of me. He lives. He lives all around me. He lives. He even lives in you. He lives. Since Jesus, death is but a mild anesthesia that separates the body and the soul. He lives. The doors of the church are open.